This video will cover Learning Objective 4.2 for PSY 235 Social Psychology, um, and this will also probably be a pretty short video. Um, what we'll be covering in this uh, section of the chapter is the issue of first impressions, um, and this learning objective really relies a lot on the things you've learned in Chapter 3 about how we automatically process or use low effort thinking in order to make quick, um, very, and by quick I mean super fast judgments about what other people are like, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and what they're most likely to do. Um, so we need to think about how do we form first, first impressions and what is the impact of those first impressions on us going forward. First impressions tend to be very, very fast require very little thought, but they tend to be durable, especially if the first impressions lead us down a negative path. So if you your first impression of someone is that they're cold or that they're rude or that they are angry, that tends to stick. Um, if you find that a person is pleasant, that's fine. It, it may be dismissed if you get a different vibe from them at a later point in time. Generally speaking though, first impressions are short, easy to make, and they tend to be pretty sticky. Initial impressions tend to be based on, um, you know, first, facial appearance. And they tend, these judgments are extraordinarily quick. So when I said fast, I meant, you know, in 100 milliseconds, which is a teeny tiny amount of time. Um, this is often referred to by cognitive scientists or, or sensation perception um, researchers as thin slicing. So we are taking very tiny bits of information and then our big cognitive system kicks in and says, what does this tiny slice of information mean? And we will, we will come to some conclusions, pretty intentional ones, about what a person's personality is most likely to be like um, and, and we're using very, very tiny pieces or samples of behavior or appearance in order to make those decisions. Over the next couple of days, try and pay attention to when you do this thin slicing with others. Think especially about, you know, when you run into someone new, someone you don't know, you don't know them at all, how quickly do you decide that they are approachable? How quickly do you decide they are weird? How quickly do you decide they're friendly? Um, and so on. All of those are things that, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's helpful that we do them at the same time. They are quite prone to error. Um, so there's a, there's a definitely a useful purpose of doing for doing it, but they can lead us down a mistaken path. One of the challenges we face is that the first inferences we make about traits that people have tends to be the one that sticks. So we call that broadly um, a kind of primacy effect. So whatever traits we, we kind of pull in and assume that another person has tend to influence the way we make sense of the person's later appearance or their later behavior. Another thing that affects these first um, impressions is something called belief pers perseverance. Um, basically what this means is once you've formed a judgment about another person, um, that new and anytime new information is present, it's very hard to let go of the initial judgment. So going back to what I said at the very first, um, when I opened this slide up, we make these judgments really quickly and they tend to be sticky, especially if we've made a judgment that is a negative one. Um, somewhat less so if it's a positive one. Positive judgments tend to be a little more vulnerable to being dismissed later. Negative ones, not so much. Why? Number one, because of the primacy effect. The first traits that we perceive that another person has tend to be forefront in mind and therefore be more cognitively accessible. Remember that thing called accessibility? And then two, because we tend to have, once we've formed an initial belief about a person, it tends to persist. So hence the term perseverance. 
our initial beliefs tend to persevere and then be used as a filter for um, making later interpretations. On the other side of things, we do have to recognize that people are capable of managing the image that they send to others. So this ups the challenge for you as a perceiver. When you're trying to do this thing called social perception, you do have to be aware that from one situation to another situation, people may attempt to present to you uh, a version of, your, of themselves that, that you will like or that you will be intimidated by, or that you'll be fearful of, whatever. We have a tendency to do what psychologists call impression management. So sometimes people are really motivated to make a super good first impression, like if you're on a first date, or you're applying for a job and you're being interviewed. So if you're highly motivated to make a good impression, you try and guess what is it that the other person is looking to see? What do they want to see in me? Um, do they want to see a lot of confidence? So how do I present myself as more confident? Um, or if I'm angry with someone and I really want the, them to understand that I'm angry and I want them to change their behavior, how do I present power and a communication of my disappointment um, and my upset? All of that is impression management. What we do when we're doing impression management work, because it is work, is consciously but also sometimes unconsciously trying to control how other people see you. Um, for the most part, this is a conscious act. If you know going in that you don't have kind of the, the just in your own internal sense of who you are, you don't quite have exactly the profile that this other person may be looking for, but it's really important to you that, they, that you make a good impression. You may act in a way, and in, in a sense it is acting, that you feel will put your your best face forward in other ways it can be a little um, more unconscious in order to be perceived as likable um, if it's more consistent with who you are when you are not attempting to make a good impression um, then it's easier and can be more unconscious there are lots of situations though where you're not making this huge conscious attempt to present a different face than what you, you normally possess. Um, any social interaction that you're in, you will do some impression management work in order for the interchange to flow nicely. Um, so when we put strangers in a laboratory situation and put them in conversation, they have a tendency to do um, a series of behaviors that allows for the conversation to take place. And a good chunk of that is impression management work. So if you put strangers in a room and tell them, you know, have a conversation that will help you get to know each other. So right there, you can imagine a script for how that's going to go. Um, so what the people do, they tend to move so that their shoulders are square with the other person. They tend to lean forward. They tend to make eye contact. They tend to smile when the other person is speaking to them which communicates openness and warmth and friendliness, which encourages the other person to speak. When that other person mirrors that same impression, it tends to continue the conversation. So sometimes it is more unconscious, just something that we do because we've learned that it, it works well. Um, another example that you're given in your text, which is a good example of how impression management works, is that you know, and this is more on the perceiver side, people will decode a fair amount of information just, you know, in an American context, pre-COVID handshake quality. Um, we, we tend to take some information from the handshake that will then be used to make some immediate judgments about the quality of the person. Um, and again, you know, this is research done pre-COVID. We, we aren't handshaking so much anymore as fist bumping. Um, so I would guess, though, that uh, if we did this kind of research again, there would be some uh, similar kinds of information we attempt to divine from um, other kinds of greeting rituals. So how, how forceful is the handshake? What does the hand itself feel like? Is the hand cold? Is the hand rough? Is the person squeezing very hard? 
very lightly. Those are all little nuggets of information that we tend to Im imbue with meaning. Um, and they can have actual real impacts depending on what the person is expecting to experience through that interaction. In addition to um, influencing how other people interpret your behavior or make um, guesses about your personality, um, the body language that you present can also affect how you feel. It can affect your emotions. It can affect the choices and behaviors that you make. It can also affect your own um, cognitive um, processing. So how you interpret new events, how you organize uh, your thinking and what you remember about a particular event. So for example, um, when I was a, a, a track athlete, um, I, I would often become you know, incredibly nervous before running races. And what one of my coaches told me, imagine what it would be like if you were the most confident human on the planet, what would your body do? And so he, he goofed around with me and tried to convince me to swagger. <laughs> and um, as ridiculous as I felt doing any of that, um, I, it, it helped to take the edge off and by experiencing my body in that more confident way, tended to take the anxiety down. So you, you may have heard, and that's why I included this picture here about the whole power pose thing. There's been a little bit of research that shows that if you adopt poses that communicate in your cultural context, power and strength, it can trickle down and influence how you feel about yourself. So it can encourage you to feel more powerful. Uh, I will say the research is a little hinky. Um, it, it's been difficult to replicate, for example. But the, the point more broadly is that how you, you present yourself can actually then have a self-fulfilling prophecy effect. If you go into a social interaction with a great deal of confidence, even if it's fake confidence, it tends to make you feel more confident, especially if the audience interprets you as having a high degree of confidence. Um, and so that's basically how the impression management process works. And that concludes my coverage of Learning Objective 4.2.